Hey everybody, it's Daphne with Laura Entertainment. We are sitting down with a very, very special person today. Syed Ali Raza Usama, correct? Yes, I got it. Correct. Yeah. Yes, 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 that is correct. <laughs> I'm excited about that. I was like, okay, I'm going to figure this out before we do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, my name is a bit of a confusion actually, and the confusion has nothing to do with America. Even in my own country, they are puzzled and they're confused. Because the Osama part is it's not my name. It's actually what my mother calls me. And since my mother is like she's a living legend, she's a she's a writer, poet, a screenwriter, a playwright, a thinker, novelist. And my whole family is actually into entertainment industry, main mainstream entertainment industry. And she calls me Osama. It's just like a pet name or a you know nickname or something she calls me. So the entire world has started calling me Osama. And it doesn't have anything to do with my legal name. My name is only Sayyid Ali Raza. Now half of the world calls me Usama Nazir and they don't know what my name is. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the funny thing, even in Pakistan, when uh, they used to write my name, the television shows, and they have always written my name wrong because they don't know what my name is. <laughs> <laughs> They just throw extra names in there. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 yeah, Sayyid, Usama, Raza, Ali, and they say, what, what, what's your name? It's Sayyid Ali Raza. So you're the first person, actually, who is has, you know, taken my entire name correctly at the first time. So I appreciate it very much. Well. Yeah, I am stoked about that. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> People get confused about stuff, you know, you because you never know. And I mean, there's been times where I've had people on where I know I was gonna screw their name up. So I'm just like, okay, you're you're just gonna have to do it. <laughs> also, a uh, couple of days back, I was discussing with my business partner, and I said, bro, our parents were had no idea about Instagram or TikTok, and they did not name us right, you know. So like 50, 60 years down the lane, our names will be Big Bash 22. Get ready for that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even really know like TikTok. I don't, I don't get on TikTok and I don't even know if I could figure that one out or, you know, as far as uploading, because I just don't see the point. I mean, I get it with the little kids wanting to do TikTok. That's fine for them. But I'm an adult. <laughs> TikTok is very dangerous. Dangerous in a in a good way. I'm saying, because uh, when I came to America, I not even when I came to America for the past ten years, even though that I was working in the main main mainstream industry in Pakistan, uh, feature films and television shows. Our television actually dominates the region. It it it's very funny. But our television actually dominates the region. So Pakistan makes very, very good television shows in its own uh, style, stylistic way. So mm -hmm. that so that India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, all of they actually watch our TV shows. And we are talking about 2 billion people. Yeah. Concentrated there. 2 billion people. Wow. Funny thing is, I went on a forced holiday in Sri Lanka, Candy. I checked in the hotel at 2 a.m., turned on the television, and to my shocked, I was shocked to see my own drama dug in the local language and it was running on TV. I, I filmed it as in I recorded on my cell phone and send it to the producer and say, this is what I'm checking into. Yeah. <clears throat> so, for the longest time, I was watching uh, very keenly the progress of social media. Then came the advertising budget globally shifting on digital media, online presence, and this thing. I have a company here in uh, US, in California. Luckily, we registered, registered a company called Beyond Magic Films. We are into ad films, music video, and branded content for social media. Mm -hmm. We we make uh, things for Instagram and Facebook and YouTube and your website. TikTok, I haven't figured it out yet because TikTok is very, very 
ruthlessly dangerous as a content creator yeah it you have to have no brainer content but there is so much brain at the back of it you know it's very intelligently wrapped very intelligently see i don't understand i mean like you know how on facebook you you make those reels and they're like 20 20 seconds or whatever it is that they put it up but i guess tiktok i don't know if you can do full videos but i know a lot of people who only do you know, maybe 15 seconds. I don't see a point in 15 seconds for that. You know, I, I just, I don't get it. Let me tell you a very funny story. I couldn't find that interview again, but again, I got lazy and I didn't look for it so much. So mm-hmm. I remember the audio and I found, and I, I listened to this, saw this on YouTube. Yeah. 1964, Stanley Kubrick started uh, his film called 2001 A Space Odyssey. It took him four years to finish. 1968, it got released. On the premiere, Stanley Kubrick was asked a bunch of questions by a journalist who was recording it. And I heard that audio. And to my surprise, he asked, what's the future of uh, the writers and the concept and the script and the film? and cinema that you see and i was i was shocked to hear that these words coming out from his mouth he said i certainly don't see a future for the novelist in the cinema i don't see a future even of the screenwriters but i am very keenly observing what these copywriters from the advertising world are are doing i think that's where the future lies and I was amazed to see this, that that guy in 1968 had the vision and he was anticipating that what you can say, how you can tell the story in 30 seconds, 40 seconds, 60 seconds, what the advertising world was about to do at that time and doing it, that's what the future was. And I highly believe that today <clears throat> the future length film is of more or less 90 minutes. I think it will come down to 40 minutes or 45 minutes because nobody has such uh, concentration span left. In like next 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, the narrative, you know, the film will have, will be like 40 minutes, 50 minutes, maximum an hour. That's going to (laughs) suck. I mean, if, if that really does happen, that will, I think, in my own opinion, I think that'll suck because you always need more time, but then you're going to have like... It's almost like the television series when everybody thinks they're 30 minutes and they're like 21 minutes, you know, and it's because the commercials, they have to put the commercials in, of course, but they're still making, you know, even like the the miniseries, um, The Offer, I just watched, binge watched that yesterday. And that, I see that they probably wanted to make a movie with that in the beginning, but they did, you know, all these little hour segments, which is awesome. And I really think they could have went on with that because it is a good show, but everything's so short, you know, on those days, you just want to hang out and watch a movie. You don't want to just sit there for 15 minutes and go through all that to set everything up and they'd be like, okay, movie's over, you know, (laughs) it's done. (laughs) Well, uh, a lot of content is evolving and changing and Honestly speaking, you don't have a fixed definition of what's a film, you know. An ad is a film. A wedding is a film. Uh, a a feature length film is a film. So it's very, it's very, it's like, it's like you know, writing on water. It's keep on shifting as the uh, uh, according to the uh, taste and priorities of the audiences, and also uh, because of the global audience now, everything is online, and where people are watching and consuming content from you know different parts of the world. It's ever so changing. And because of the economic conditions, people don't have so much time now. So they want to, they, they want it fast, they want it now, and they want to decide in the first five minutes that they want to watch it or not. Yeah. And I mean, that almost puts everything on the advertising of it, you know, beforehand, before anything goes out, even movies, TV shows, it doesn't matter, you know, music, 
songs, stuff like that, it seems like the only way that people will figure it out is by the ad and the branding. And yeah. that's why I like what I do because, <laughs> I mean, I do everything. I'm like a basically t- jack of the spade, basically through the, all of it because I do writing, I do producing, I do, you know, I run all three of these businesses and then one of them's entertainment, media, and press. And I like that portion of it too, because I get the only way you're going to catch somebody's eye or attention is if you push it out by advertising the hell out of it, but it better be good. You know, if you're going to advertise the hell out of it, because you don't want to pay a bunch of money for stuff that, you know, you know, it's not worth a shit, you know, (laughs) know, that's why I've done the stuff the way I do with like the movie I'm doing. And it's just like, I knew to push that immediately push it, you know, and just keep pushing, pushing and pushing and pushing because now a lot of people know about the movie. Some people have read that script. Some people, you know, I have not sent the script to, but it got that way because of the way I branded the movie, packaged the movie and put it out there, you know, and people are interested, but you got to do things, you know, a lot of marketing advertising that's huge i i remember it's like a couple of years back or like four or five years back there's a great actor from india called amita bachan he is the actor who started his career in the 1970s and he have been you know through the evolution of the cinema uh, globally and <clears throat> specifically from bollywood he's yeah. the same guy who actually did a cameo appearance with the uh, uh, leonardo dicaprio in baz lerman's great gatsby Wow. Yeah, so in the in the New York, uh, New York or somewhere else, he is in the restaurant. He just has one scene with uh, DiCaprio and said cameo appearance. He said very very something very interesting. He said in nineteen back in the days like seventies, eighties, nineties. He said that back in the days we used to you do a film and then promote the film. Yeah. Now I think in late two thousands, I think we promote the film and then go do the movie that we are promoting it. So it's the other way around. So so the promotion has taken the large part of the entire business. And uh, I think it's good because you your message is actually, as a creator, your message is reaching further and further. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then that, that just makes all, you know, it pays off for everybody in the end because there are people all over the world. And with social media, it's great because everybody all over the world you know they they already know like when's it coming out i've got people in canada that are constantly asking me when is this movie getting made when is this movie getting made i'm one person who's been doing let me see here um 98% of the work even including with writing with another person i can only do so much <laughs> you know <laughs> i'm working on it that's all i can say you know i'm working on it calm down i will get it done you know but i mean advertising is huge you reach so many people and they're so happy to know about these things you know and then when they're it comes out you already know if they're that interested they're going to go and see it you know True. True. it's just True. it's awesome so your mom was in the industry is that how you got in my grandfather there were three brothers from my mother's side. There were three brothers and they did not want to do the family occupation of medicine. My father, my grandfather's father or either his uncle was the first Muslim surgeon in British uh, army because at that time India was under the occupation of, uh, as in it was colonized by Britain. So yeah. either his father or his father's uncle was the first ever uh, Indian Muslim surgeon in the British Army. So these three brothers, they came and they turned around to the family and said, no, we are not going into medicine, which was a big, uh, oh my God, at that time, you know, early I- 1930s <laughs> or 20s. And they said, okay, so what do you want to become? They said, we will be, you know, and go in arts and we're going to be writers. So my uh, mother's father, as in my grandfather from my mother's side, he... Uh, became a writer he joined all india radio at that time because there was no television and then after 1947's partition of india and pakistan they migrated to pakistan and joined 
which later became that part of that section became all in uh, radio pakistan rather than from all india radio and the other brother uh, of my grandfather he went to britain and he never got married to no offspring just one guy he started working for bbc and he used to work in bbc and everybody knew where he is and he had his own you know a little small throne and kingdom and everything and he was he became the concept and visualizer and uh, a literary person from which they used to uh, uh, bounce ideas in britain for bbc my uh, grandfather became a script writer and a pronunciation expert for five languages uh, arabic persian hindi uh, sanskrit which is older section of hindi and english for all the actors who used to perform on uh, radio so every script rehearsal sessions he used to sit down and he used to correct the diction and performance and the pronunciation for these five languages and he 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 was not only a poet he was a writer as well and he was a script writer and then my mother started when she was 9 years old in kids programming she used to be a, a, a broadcaster as in a sound actor voice actor when she was 9 year old she started and all my <clears throat> my mother and so our uh, family uh, tradition is very artistic and everything so all my cousins are are, are actually so my my mother became writer my, all our aunts are writer even who are successful or not successful they have a knack for arts they know how to read they know how to write they know how to perform then i am the <clears throat> third generation in this business all my cousins are, are are either actors or directors or writers even the fourth one is there uh, there's a filmmaker who is son of my uh, uh, first cousin he uh, won two international awards for his short films and others are following and everything my mother name is in color curriculum in syllabus so when you go and read the uh, subject urdu as a as a language so in the dramatist my mother's name is there that she is a, a dramatist she's a right she's a writer she writes uh, television plays and all wow <laughs> that's crazy that's a lot i mean bollywood <laughs> is coming hard uh, i yeah. i can see that now like my granddaughter um she was watching this little cartoon it was so cute it's called mira the royal detective and she knew how to do the dance the i mean you got to <laughs> she was only 2 and she knew the whole damn dance and i'm just sitting there watching her like oh my god <laughs> 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 because it was on youtube it was like a cute little cute, so cute little cartoon it was so cute there's a, there's a book uh that's in india as in the entire region you can call it india because the culture is almost the same there is a book that is more than 5000 years old and the book is is called natya shastra natya means performance shastra means uh, gospel you can say so there is a whole gospel about performance which actually deals in how big the theater should be what are the criteria of a good performance or a bad performance there's a there's a there's something very funny written written in that book and i've read it myself it says that the performance should not be evaluated on how many awards it won mm -hmm. the performance should be evaluated by how devotedly it was performed and i'm talking about this 5000 years ago so that entire region is very evolved when it comes to storytelling yeah yeah I, I I like the the history portion of it. I mean that's that's awesome. A lot of actors nowadays over here in the states, anyway, they half of them don't take time to be trained, and you you can see it. You know, <laughs> you can just see it. But then you have the other what the other actors that they do the training. they read all these books you know mm -hmm. to learn it better and then you get a better understanding when you when you're more educated i think you have a better understanding of things yeah this is yeah. just and then and then education uh 
can be acquired or attained in any way. It doesn't have to be a dedicated place like a university. It can be anything. Whatever mean or vessel through which you can get yourself educated, that's, you know, that's, 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 that's about it. That's good. Yeah. I, I, I did the same thing. I went to, um, I d- didn't go to college for anything to do with this industry, anything. And I did two years of med. And then I did four years of forensic profiling to profile serial killers, well, you know, serial killers and rapists and stuff like that. That that is the people I wanted to go after, and I stayed on the dean's list. And then I fell into the movie industry after I'd already ran a business, you know, all them years. Didn't have anything to do with what I went to school for. <laughs> so and I learned on my own. I did. You know, I've went through training and stuff, but I learned on my own by doing, yeah. you know. Same, same here. So uh, I had to abandon my education because uh, when I was growing up, my parents were struggling financially a lot, mm-hmm. a lot, humongous amount of struggle. Uh, and they both were from, you know, privileged backgrounds in terms of uh, what they saw in life. But that tiny part was very, very rough. Uh, and I had to abandon my uh, my, academy, my 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 education because I could not uh, afford the fee of the college and everything. I went to school for business. Uh, and I'm glad because I have that entrepreneurial part from that. But then I went into uh, in industry and started as an apprentice. So I started, although that my, my mom was a rising, becoming a rising star, and she was, you know, uh, climbing up the ladder in the industry as a good writer. But I did not uh, took a shortcut of, you know, getting into a production. I started from second assistant director and climbed my way up, uh, in the on, on as in in the ladder. And the first time I went inside of a university was to teach direction production design and cinematography that's the first time i saw the official inside of a university so how we uh, say is till 12 standard so we call it school uh, that is like high school then you have to do four years of college which is mandatory and after four years of college then comes the university so you go for masters and your bachelors in the university we don't call it college so there's a there's a different way of uh, yeah. you know, you call it <laughs> thing there. So I went to the university to teach the students of uh, bachelors and masters in cinematography and in production design and screenplay writing and direction. Wow. So <laughs> it's not like okay, so it's different over there as far as the edu. See, sometimes I feel like they need to keep the kids in a little longer. You know, like just because you can tell (laughs) and it will help them in the future. But now in these schools, I just don't get it. They're they're wanting to take so much stuff that's really important for them to be learning. And they're trying to move in more stuff, you know, that I get it has to do with everyday life stuff, but there's a point in time where they need to learn that in school and they have parents or role models, mentors, people that can teach them other things, you know, versus what they do in the school. And they really do. I, I feel like sometimes that they really need to do that. And my daughter, um, she was in the army and she was talking about teaching, but she didn't want to teach here in the States. She wanted to go to Japan because she said Japan has a really good school system. And in a way, when I was looking at some videos on Japan, I see a lot because they teach the kids how to, you know, they got to clean before they do anything. And then they got to clean afterwards. And it's just like really pretty. And sometimes I feel like they need that here. Japan. Well, let me explain something and then come to Japan. When my, so when I moved here, my son, uh completed his high school my daughter still had to go for two more years so she came and she became a sophomore 
and then she graduated the funny thing is both of my kids told me that uh, dad don't worry american education system is very easy for us i said how she said because we are coming from british education system and it is much more tougher than the american one i said okay we'll 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 cross the bridge once we'll get there she came here and she started from middle of this uh, class because we migrated here on, on, in march and she went to school uh, next semester and uh, it was so easy for her to actually so 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 because my my children were from british education system so they actually had to work hard and harder as compared to here but i don't know how it it, it works maybe they will be answering it better because they are in the system yeah. coming to japan i think they are out of this world because what's happening for the past 2 3 uh, uh, soccer world cup in fifa is when they come when there's a match between japan and any other country the japanese uh, spectators they clean their side of stadium and then go and it's happening consecutively and i so 100% they are doing something absolutely right in their education system yep yeah. i agree i mean because if you go to a stadium here you're lucky if you're not sitting in spilt beer or piss <laughs> seriously i have to Are i have you? to explore this i haven't i haven't been to a stadium here oh my goodness <laughs> <laughs> it's complete chaos i mean like my daughter um my youngest she had a she sang at two reds games um in the year that i went because the next year it, it got rained out and that was the first time i was actually in a baseball stadium oh my god since maybe i was 10 and i just looked around like oh lord there's stuff thrown everywhere you got to worry about stepping on stuff or you know what i mean the seats and i'm just like oh wow <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> but that's a good thing though because i always do like if i go somewhere and i've got like drinks or something or anything even if i go out to view the bands or something i I end up cleaning the tables and I'm not even working there. You know. <laughs> this is this is what you do. There's there's one there's one game that actually attracts me and I think that I want to learn this and I think I'm going to enjoy it and that's American football. I <laughs> I I don't understand what's going on yet, but uh, I by the by the look of it, by the sound of it, it has attraction. So I am attracted towards that game. probably probably i'm going to you know find somebody who will teach me and i i, I can start enjoying it <laughs> it's a bunch of people running up and down the field with a ball getting their asses whipped <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what it is that's why america loves it <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah, they but, get their but, frustration out on the football <laughs> exactly but 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 for coming from that part of the world i am still at the stage where i'm figuring out what's the connection between foot and the ball because they're not using their foot in kicking this ball <laughs> and then europe calls soccer football yeah. which kind of throws me off sometimes when somebody will be talking about soccer but football and i'm sitting there thinking what are they talking about you know as far as that i don't recall that and then it dawns on me duh they <laughs> Hello. <laughs> It's the same thing over there. But American yeah. football, they they are rough, man. They're yeah. rough. Yes. Yeah. And I think you'll like that, you know. I I I don't feel like well, anymore it seems like college football is more popular than the NFL. Oh, and wow. It, and the reason why I think it's like that is because the NFL for a certain amount of time it seems like and i mean hopefully they stop it was all poli uh, politics you know and people normal everyday people and people were were fed up with the politic bullshit you know and that's with a lot of people because right now we can't even tell who the hell's running the country you know <laughs> so and then they're dragging that into a football game that is supposed to be about the sport. Yeah. Why is it political? I mean, if you want to turn it political, 
then get all the politicians to go down there and play their own game and let's watch them knock the shit out of each other and we can all just sit back and drink you know that, that, will, that will actually be a very cost effective way of settling down disputes rather than countries going to war with each, each other yeah you know? yeah put them in a stadium and let them beat each That's other it. there you go i'm on board with that <laughs> yeah that will be most more cost cost effective and fun too right <laughs> <laughs> and that's a lot of damn countries. I think we should put, let me see, the the little short guy over in North Korea, was his, Kim Yon Jong, whatever his name is. We'll yeah. put him in. We'll put Putin in. We'll put <laughs> our people in. You know what I mean? And we'll just throw them all in there and we'll just let them beat each other up. And then we don't have to worry about nuclear war. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> there's a there's a funny actually there's a funny scene in, in Pirates of the Caribbean where Jack, Captain Jack Sparrow actually says that you guys want to fight all of them just because these two people i said let them fight and then we can decide <laughs> i just don't get it i mean you see so much and there there's and it's only a couple of the leaders you know it's not even all the leaders from these countries it's a couple and they've got their egos are way beyond where they need to be you know they they got to come back to reality because if not, everybody's going to suffer. And I don't think they realize, you know, and I had brought this up beforehand. If, because everybody's like, well, what if America, if they nuke America, you know what I mean? This and that. I'm like, okay, well, why don't you think about this? And maybe this, you know, can put some sense into their heads over in these other countries that talk about wanting to nuke us. If they do drop a nuclear weapon on America, okay, and it hits even around where um, the volcano is, Yellowstone. Yellowstone erupts. It's not going to just be America who dies. It's going to be the whole friggin' world because that is a super volcano. And <laughs> bye bye to everybody. You know, yeah. everybody in the whole world. It has, and it's not even an asteroid, but that thing can do asteroid level damage. Yeah, and sure. they don't use the brains yeah. when they're. Yeah, I I I have uh, this opinion. I am of this opinion that a the table is big for everyone to sit down and eat. Right. No matter where you are. And right. secondly, it's never Russia against America or America against China or any other country against any other country. We all live on one planet. Exactly. And you can't fight half of your own body. It's like my this hand starts to hit this hand. What I would, yeah, my, this is for me, it is absurdity. Yeah. Sit down on the table, talk, decide, and get this war thing over. It's the most stupid thing humans can do. And nobody really even knows. I mean, half the time, nobody really even knows why they're fighting because yeah. they're not going to come right out. And I know it's all nuclear, you know, I get it, whatever, it's a money thing, but. Do they not take into consideration that if some stuff like that does go down and people do get stupid, they're you know not just I killing think? one, they're killing everybody. everybody. You know what, I, what I think, <clears throat> I think for the 10,000 years, <clears throat> we have tried making most of the men head of states in any system. Let's try for 50 years by making all the women head of states important things in the world. Let's give it this shot. Maybe <laughs> the world turns out very different. So purposely elect all the women on the most senior positions for 50 years and try out this model. Maybe there are a bunch of countries not talking to each other, but at least not fighting. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know and then they can go play football. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> <laughs> and they might need to who knows <laughs> True. i don't know i mean something's got to give you think i mean we don't want to according to i don't know i'm not trying to get religious but you know as far as the world just keeps happening over and over and over do we really want to keep doing that you know can we just stop because apparently after the nuclear war breaks out everybody dies and then we do it all again you know <clears throat> Let's yeah. everybody just chill out. <laughs> exactly. And the funny and the funny thing is when I was growing up, so my uh, parents are not uh, you can say not average Pakistanis mm -hmm. because my mother is, you know, 
a writer, a thinker. My father uh, was, uh, my stepfather was actually an Arab from Iraq and he was a political leader in exile. So I didn't had uh, conventional parents. You yeah. know, I had ordinary parents. <laughs> I found, I, I asked them about religion when I was growing up and they said that we will not give you a God. We will not lend you a God. Go find your own God. The purpose is to become a good human. Right. So the way I see religion is if if I respect all the religion and I don't follow any particular religion, I just follow the goodness. If your religion and the end goal of your religion is to make a human a good human, we don't have any disagreement. I am here to get myself better and better every day. And it doesn't matter that what the, the, the good idea is coming from where. Any culture, any religion, if something it it, it makes you a better human. I'm adapting that thing. That's how I feel. I'm a, I'm a, well, I'm an ordained minister. And, oh. but people are like, well, you don't go to church. Okay. I get that. I did that years ago, but I feel like it's more than that. It's more, I'm more spiritual, you know, when it comes to things. And I feel like there's more than just what's there. You know, and you can't always fight about everything because you never know. So my, the way I think about it is I support everybody. I don't see color when it comes to humans. I don't care if somebody's LB, you know what I mean? I don't care who they're sleeping with. It's none of my business. Let them do them, you know, and it's just so many people that argue or they're back and forth about it or oh well it's a religion and it's this not hey if that makes them happy leave them the hell alone you know oh. and that's with anybody any race anything i don't see that shit i see the people for who yeah. they are you know True. if they're shit then yeah i'm gonna call them out you're a shitty human being but not not everybody you know what i mean come on it's True. so annoying it is it's annoying <laughs> It's true. You're you're absolutely right. You're right. And for people to fight about, you know, well, you're that religion, so I just don't like you. Oh, come on. You know what I mean? <laughs> what the hell? I just don't get it. I don't get it. You know, I think people should be entitled to believe whatever they want to believe, period. Yeah. You yeah. know. And the funny thing is, no system or no religion tell you to do bad things. It's the, it's the act of individual or a group of people who are acting out these shitty things under the name of something else and then that something else gets judged, you know, uh, judged for that. Yeah. So honestly speaking, it's it's not even that system that is doing it. Yeah. The, I mean, that's true. You've got just so many, and it's not even just in other countries. It's the same thing here in the States. It is. Because, you know, you've got one Catholic person who did something wrong and then all of a sudden the whole damn system flops. Exactly. Or, you know, somebody who's Christian did something wrong and then that whole system flops. And it's just like, yeah, you can't blame the whole world for somebody being stupid. Of course. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'll call it like it's a... Itself is, that itself is stupidity. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for their stupidity, they're blaming everybody in the world. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, <laughs> It's just like, okay, my, uh, for instance, we'll do a for instance here. Okay. My son was serving and his squad was over in um, Budapest and in Budapest, they can't, I guess, have any kind of weapons when they go into town, but there were two ununiformed Russians that come in and jumped his squad and they come out and they shot my, they shot my son, but you know, those people are under Putin. Putin's the one that's shit. They need to get him out of there for the sake of that country. Get him the hell out of there, you know? And do I hate every single Russian person because my son got shot by one? No, I don't. I'd like to find the person who did shoot my son, but yeah. you know, that's not going to happen. But it was ordered by somebody to do that. You know? And also, and the funny thing is, it doesn't matter which country you go in. If you go in and you ask the common person, most of the chances are that they are already fed up with their own uh, uh, rulers. 
<laughs> I haven't met a single guy from any country who is completely satisfied by the ruling class that are ruling them. You know, in the government or kingdom or anything. No, they are not. They are. They are. And I mean, the funny part about that with like Russia is, you know, the Ru- the Ukrainian war, or whatever that's going on over there, is if you know you keep giving Putin that rope. And I'm sorry, now all of those people that his actions affected, they lose, they're losing their money, they're losing their businesses, they're losing everything. So they're going to be fed up eventually and they're going to be the ones to do the job. They are already. Yeah. They are already. already. And then he lies to his people about what's going on. Especially after, after COVID. All the governments around the world, including United States, are under tremendous pressure by their people because of inflation and the cost of living and everything. So it it's it's the world is a mess right now. Yeah, I mean, well, I yeah. I had a conversation um with it was a writer on one of the interviews I believe, or maybe we were off camera when we had the conversation. I think we were off camera when we had the conversation. And we were talking about, you know, what's going on as far as the politicians here in America. And I was like, you know, you sit here and you watch all these these refugees, you know, that are coming in. But do they realize while they're coming in that shit is really screwed up here, too? You know, and the fact also <clears throat> right now we're we used to be one. Of, I mean, I'm not saying we're bad, but we used to be one of the best damn countries in the whole damn world. What the hell was going on? Because right now we're a laughing stock. And yeah. I'm really pro military. Everybody knows that. But as far as the politicians, I am done with both parties because I am an independent and I will be voting for Kennedy because he oh. is an independent. <laughs> I don't have my citizenship yet. Uh, I still have to see. So how immigration is? It? So I uh, thank God that I got. Uh, the immigration under extraordinary ability. So I'm here under that. Yeah. Uh, it is designed that I have to witness one election and then will be able to vote. So I have to, I'm still figuring it out. So two things that I have to figure out is one is the political system and then US. Mm-hmm. Then two, I have my save and I get naturalized and I, I get my citizenship. And the second is American football. <laughs> I have to figure these these two things out. <laughs> well, if you want to have a good time, see the football. But if you want to laugh at people, then you'll enjoy what's coming this next year as far as the do, elections. Do, do, you think, <laughs> do, do you think from my perspective, it's the same entertainment and both the things? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it has same entertainment value for me. It's just crazy because I mean, right now I we we're getting laughed at. We are. I mean, and it's everybody else, everybody who's voting. It's their own fault because I mean, look, <clears throat> we exactly have two good people there to to vote from. You know, so me when I vote, I've always been a swing voter anyway because I'll listen to what somebody says in the interest for the people versus how much money they're going to get from everybody. You know, I want to see who's going to do what that's best. And right now my money isn't with either one of them. And I've even jumped onto um, Kennedy's campaign trail. And because I like what he has to say, you know, granted I get, there's always going to be an issue with one person, their views, somebody it's going to make somebody mad. But what people need to stop and think about is what is really best for this country right now. Well, I, 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 uh, on a on a lighter and a funny note, when I migrated here, I'm I, I'm single. I'm single for the past like uh, three four years, uh, and I am expecting that when whenever I will find a girl. So I came here single in California. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I have a film company now, and I'm a director and a cinematographer. And the two things that I'm expecting from my possible girlfriend is to teach me the politics and teach me how to uh, play American football so I can enjoy the game. <laughs> <laughs> hey then i tell you what i mean i don't know i'm pretty sure la i don't think there are maybe too many women football fans i don't know there could be you know i'm in orange county i i i'm in orange county 
Oh, okay. So you're down towards Anaheim. I am down. I am right next to uh, Irvine. Okay. Yeah. I lived yeah. in Anaheim, God, for six months when I was young, but I grew up in Vegas and then <laughs> my family was from back here. So it kind of moved back, you know, but I guess there, there are so many things that are different everywhere. Like you go to California, they do stuff one way. You go to Vegas, it's a whole different way. Then you go down to Florida, it's a different way. You know, it's yeah. just, everybody's different. But the, <laughs> the women in the Midwest, I will tell you this, we are firecrackers. We that do is- love sports. <laughs> you know? That is nice. Politics, the women are just pretty much over it, you know, along with a lot of the guys, but we're over it. America is literally new world for me. Let me tell you a funny story that how I accidentally came to America. <laughs> I never had any active intention in my life to come to America. I came here by an accident. I was filming a TV show that was is based on a book, a very, very hot cake book that the writer of that novel actually won a presidential award for writing that book. It was so famous. It is so famous. I was commissioned to make the television project and the the book is actually broken into two parts. First part occurs in in Pakistan. The second part, so it's a modern adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. Let's put it this way. So Juliet dies in the middle of the story and then Romeo actually uh, migrates to uh, Britain and he uh, resumes his uh, education and goes to Oxford University to get his master's. And then what he sees is somebody actually walking exactly like the the, room, the Juliet, but she's a different person. But she is 100% resembles the same girl. Yeah. So, yeah. So and, and, and the story has multiple uh, conflicts. So the Romeo is actually enlightened, Western cultured, influenced, non-religious guy but the juliet is daughter of a clergyman very poor very conservative so there are multiple layers of you know uh friction and conflict in this story and for a very silly reason the protagonist got denied for the uk visa and this we couldn't understand that why he got denied because this guy is 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 you know is is popular and the internet is full of it <clears throat> and their temperatures were very high because you know a lot of uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, was on stake and everything and then in that couple of days of this problem he said i have a work permit for 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 america we can go and film in america and everybody started cursing him because the book doesn't say that the guy goes to America. Book says he goes to UK. And we were getting, I got the work permit to go and film the series in UK. And now I can't go without the the, the lead actor. So we actually converted the entire thing to America. Wow. And I came by an accident. <laughs> before, before 2016, the only two, three things that I knew about America is there's a White House and there's a president that sits in the White House. <laughs> there's a B&H that is in New York that sells camera. It's a, it's a camera store. And the second thing is there's an Universal Studios in, uh, in LA. That's it. And I never had any intention of coming to America. It, if it hadn't been that particular show, I wouldn't have came to America ever. Ever. No friends, no family, no ties. Not even an active uh, uh, wish list or bucket list that I want to go and see America. For <laughs> me, that part did not exist, you know. <laughs> Although that it is very common for uh, an average or above average Pakistani to have a second citizenship of either Australia or Canada or America or Britain. It's very common. But I never had that urge. When I was sent to film that show in America... I, as a as a supervisor only, and I landed in Miami to catch a flight going to Houston because Houston has a lot of Pakistani and Indian community, and all the television actors they are very famous in India also. You know the team because I told you that Pakistan's television uh, mm-hmm. dominates the entire region, so there are a lot of Indian 
uh, Indian fans who watch our television shows and they actually like it and praise it. Yeah. And when I get out of the plane to catch my connecting flight and I saw people on the airport, there's something inside of me that said, you belong here. Mm -hmm. Didn't know what to do, how to do. And I was part of the project for like a, more than a month. And then <clears throat> there's a veteran actor from Pakistan. He was a very, very renowned actor in the 90s. Think of Robert De Niro of yeah. that age, of that style of acting and everything. And we finished the show and I built a very strong association with that guy. And I, I had to catch a flight and go back after three days. And uh, I said to him that, and he, he, he moved to America in 1990s, left everything and moved there. And I said that I actually like this place. And he smiled and he said, I knew about it, that you're going to come and you're going to like it here. And I said, I want to live here. He said, do you? I said, yes, but I don't know how. He actually got up from his chair, gave a kiss to my forehead and said that you have been so kind and so respectful to me. That as a father figure, I want to gift something to you. And I said, what? He said that there is a way that you can actually migrate to America. And I know uh, for sure that you will, you will qualify in that category. And that was extraordinary ability, which is known as EB1A. Go back. I'm going to give you a lawyer. Apply for this category. And, if, and, I, and I am 100% sure that you're going to qualify for this and you're going to move to America. And seriously... I actually applied it, got approved, and moved here under the category. This is how this is how I'm here. Wow! I'm is just that, following. I'm just following that voice inside of me said that I belong here. The the story you were referring to, it, it almost it kind of reminded me of um, Bram Stoker's Dracula, sort of, where his wife, you know, ends up dying and then. Winona Ryder came back, you know, it, that kind of jumped in my head when you were talking about the Romeo and Juliet. I was like, that kind of sounds familiar. <laughs> I really, I, I like that version of the movie, you know, I don't, I don't know why there's a lot of people that put that movie down, but I, I like it. I like the movie. Yeah. 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 And I mean, that is funny though, the way things happen. Because you never know. <laughs> the funny, so the funny part is, this is half of the story that I told you that this that that the voice came inside of me and said something in 2016. Actually, it started in 2013. 2008, I directed a show uh, for Pakistan, which actually changed the way Pakistani television is actually done. So I became kind of a wonder boy in 2008 and 2009 by that show, because of that show. And after the first episode was broadcasted, uh, the entire industry wanted to film the way I have filmed that show. And that actually gave me an opportunity <clears throat> to make the movie, which started the second wave of cinema in Pakistan. So I directed a feature-length film which was internationally released in 2013, which not only was the first ever sports film of Pakistan, it was first ever digital film of Pakistan. It actually started the second wave of cinema in Pakistan. And I had the honor uh, to direct that film. Wow. Yeah. And right after that, that so it, we started the movie in 2011, 12, 13. It got released 2000, th later half of 2013, 14 and 15. I was commissioned the biggest ever show in Pakistan's history uh, in terms of financial, as in terms of money, budget, in terms of production design. Uh, that show actually was the most expensive show that ever got filmed in Pakistan. It was the show that introduced the production design element in Pakistan in television. It also introduced the Rembrandt lighting in Pakistan for the television show Mainstream. And that during that show, <clears throat> I we, they, we were supposed to film uh, a, a, a sequence in a cemetery. And I reached the cemetery where we had the fake grave, you know, set up for filming before my crew. So the director was on location before the crew and actors actually got there. 
and I called them and I said, "Why? Where are you guys?" They said, "Oh, we are on our way, and this happened and that happened. You know, the usual production stuff." So they say, they they told me either I go back and come back again when the crew is there, or I can stay there. So I I said to them, "There's no point of me going back. I'm gonna just wait here for you guys to see to come, and I will you know do the location scout because I haven't seen where you guys has marked the grave." So I went there. I saw the grave. It was fine for the filming standard, and I sat down on that uh, near the grave and i was waiting for my film crew and that day although that my career was not like going this my career was going like this you know i was the best thing at that time the entire pakistan knew about me i just released a film called uh, mehu shahid afridi which means i am shahid afridi based on a cricketer so we come from a cricketing world right because of the uh, british so my film actually had the cricketer star shahid afridi he did the cameo appearance so that was the biggest project of that time and i was filming the biggest television project at that time and something inside of me said on that day in the cemetery i don't belong here and i said what what well and i was puzzled about it and this was 2013 okay right? or beginning of 2014 and that thought actually went by and you know i started filming and i did countless of television show after that and projects and this and that and in 2016 when i landed in miami the same voice actually said i belong here so the sentence was completed you do not belong here you belong here yeah yeah <laughs> i feel like that sometimes where i'll go to a place you know and i just feel like man this feels like home and i think it's it's that way for me right now with florida or islands anywhere like that yeah and that feels more like home yeah. than home you yeah. know so there's a <clears throat> there's a very funny quote very uh, deep quote actually that i uh, the other day i was reading and this is by an egyptian writer called najib mehfuz he actually i think if i'm not mistaken he won uh, Pulitzer Award or Nobel Peace Prize Award for literature, in in something. His Najib Mehfuz, his name is. He's an Egyptian writer. He said that home is not where you are born. Home is that part of the world from when you are there. All uh, the wish to escape from there it diminishes. Yeah. If you don't feel like moving somewhere else, that's your home. And this is what I feel about California. I don't want to go anywhere from here. Yeah. I think this is my home. Yeah, and I love Egyptian anything Egyptian. Um I'm actually I just picked up a project that oh, nice. is based on that. I won't go into it right here because we're recording, but afterwards I'll tell you a little bit about it and it's really cool. It just I've always been obsessed with Egyptian stuff. Egypt, you know, the whole thing. I've never been there. I've but, been there. You know, I've been there. Really? Yeah. See, my neighbor over here, her sister's in the um, armed forces, and she actually was just there for a whole year. They sent the reserves over for a year. I'm also trying to get a double citizenship because I'm trying to get um, dual citizenship to Italy. Oh. And, but, Proving, you know, getting the documentation from Ellis Island, that is like a pain in the ass because <laughs> you can never get them people on the phone. I have tried. I, I, think, I think there's a, I think there's a, a program. I, it may be right or may be wrong, but there's a program in some part of Italy where there are a lot of old houses and they sell you the place for one US dollar if you are willing to renovate it and fix it and live there. Yep. Oh, I would. I'd buy like five, six, seven, whatever. I don't care because I would just love, I actually, because yesterday was my daughter's birthday and I told her, I was like, we're going to do something a little different this year because, you know, usually she, she has everything she needs and there's only so many things you can buy for your kid, you know? And I told her, I'm ready to do experiences. I mean, we've taken vacations. So I was looking at cruises and I was like, well, you know, we could do that. And then I got looking at, you know, Europe, Italy, the Maldives, you know what I mean? And I'm like, or we can do that. So I told her um, yesterday, I was like, you know, we can either 
go and take the cruise on spring break, or we can wait until summer and go to Europe, you know, and do some of the things over there and different places over there. And yeah. I cannot wait. I cannot <laughs> wait. Because I'm just dying to go over and explore. <laughs> yeah. I really can't, you know, there's, I already see most of America. I'm good. You know, I'm ready to. Oh, I, I need to do this. I actually want to go, I want to travel from East Coast to West Coast in a car, you know, exploring all the places because I would love to go and see, you know, discover America in true form. You would have fun. You would. I mean, there are some really, really cool places if you decide to do that to check out. Um, I know in Kentucky, they have Mammoth Cave and that is supposed to be really, really cool. I haven't even been there and I live around here. You know what I mean? <laughs> and then there was, um, oh my God, there are just so many things, so many different places that you could go. Like I, I'm more sort of a person who would love to go and see the sites. But actually, I'm more sort of a person who would love to go and meet people. Yeah. Yep. I I find fun in meeting people, understanding different people, uh, understanding the differences, appreciating the differences, asking them, why do you do this thing like this and not like this? And then they tell you, you know, the effectiveness or how it works better for them. And 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 I, and I there's just so much to learn from different cultures and different people, honestly speaking. So you're, you're a people person like me. And I I like that too, because one time I went to Florida. Okay. Well, did the cruise thing. And then I went to Siesta Key. We were sitting there. Um, they had a drum circle. Well, this guy, um, this homeless man, he had approached and he had beer. I had food. It was an equal trade, you know? <laughs> so it fed him. And I didn't even know about the drum circle that they were going to do there on the beach. So I'm sitting there drinking, having a conversation, eating meal, whatever. I did not care because this man, he was, you know, ex-military. He had some awesome stories. I was happy to entertain. And yeah. me, I talk to everybody. It doesn't matter who it is. I can be in a grocery store. It doesn't matter. I talk to everybody. So being a people person, Yes. So my 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 entire individuality of what I do, what I love, and what I'm passionate about it it, it revolves around humans. Yeah, I love doing photography, and I'm in absolutely in love with the human art form, and uh and and in the f women art form actually. You know, I love photographing women. I love doing portraits. Uh, I love telling stories of human. And I enjoy the company of humans. This is who I am. I'm a storyteller. Mm. I don't want to go without a human to even a good landscape thing. You know, yeah. I want to have the best company with the best view. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so I mean, this is what I do. Yeah. Some people, I mean, they they just, I think it's funny when people are like, oh, they're stuck up or you're, you know, they think. Just because they look at you, they don't know you, haven't even said hi, bye, nothing. And they're like, oh, you're stuck up. And that's what they think. But then when I start going, <laughs> I just start going. Yeah, I think I think any sort of animosity, even in the slightest, slightest or the remote, remotest way, is only because you are not understanding, you don't know the, the other person. If yeah. you start knowing them, then even how absurd thing they are saying, you're going to actually understand their point of view and you're going to say, well, the guy has a point or this person has a point because he's looking at the world, the world like this or he has been conditioned like this or he went through a trauma like this. So it's very uh, natural to be the way he is or she is, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. so that animosity can only exist if you don't know the person. I agree. I agree. And... Then that takes us all the way back to where we were, you know, if they have issues, you throw them in a stadium. <laughs> <laughs> Let them get it out that way. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. I just I, I think that idea we we got right there is just brilliant. It is yeah. brilliant, you know. <laughs> now we just it, need to it, make it happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, so the so the problem of the North Korean uh, leader is that he wants to remain the king 
give him an island say you have an island you're a king here let the people here. exactly so so you are restored people are saved from famine and all and we don't have any conflict i agree no we put him and putin on there <laughs> yeah, exactly hi yeah today today i was hearing in the news that he actually fired a a, a, a he did the a missile test which was violating you know certain things and i started busting into laughter because it is just like you have a firecracker and you're a 5 year old kid and you want to go out and you know play with it <laughs> the sparklers <laughs> exactly yeah but on but on a massive scale and you actually can harm a lot of people but it's the same stupidity people oh my god yeah that would be it i mean maybe instead of giving them the bigger fireworks we just start them off with a sparkler and let them enjoy that you know exactly <laughs> on their cruise <laughs> by <Bye>, everybody <laughs> I, i mean i agree i'm on the same level you are and i know there's so many people out there that are on that same level you know but man it's all going to take it is going to be up to the people that actually put them in the, that position you know yeah. anymore yes. but yeah. the good thing over here is we've got the power to take them out of that position you know which is awesome because there's yeah. people that just really should not but with, but with power comes responsibility with authority comes responsibility yeah you... well the people who are in power here aren't very responsible <laughs> <laughs> at all i'm telling you yeah. i'd probably have a better shot you know at watching my 16 year old run the country anymore you know it's just like so this 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 election this us election will be so much fun for me to watch because i'm i'm not invested emotionally in either side so it's the same entertainment value for me and then i'll gonna go and you know whatever oh, side you're gonna love it And yeah. I I can tell you this right now. I mean, just because you're you're like on the outside looking inside. It, exactly. it it's going to get interesting, I can tell you because you've got Trump, then you've got Biden, and we don't know where Biden is and he don't even know where the hell he is half the time and then Trump <laughs> doing his own little thing or whatever, you know. But then you've got and that's why I just feel like Kennedy right now is the best shot we've got at anything because those two are so loco, you know. <laughs> they just they need out. Let them go, you know. <laughs> Let them both go and bring somebody else in. But when they start and you'll see it when it starts going on TV when they're this shit and scandal and this and that and it's just like Here we go, you know, and I've had this conversation with so many people about um okay. And I'm not saying, you know, that the, well really, I don't really care about that. But okay, Trump when Trump was going through it with Biden the last election and he made this comment with it was him and some buddies and they're talking about grab her by the pussy, you know what I mean? Okay. <laughs> and then you've got women that are coming forward. Okay, and I grew up with eight brothers, eight. And I, there's nothing that I have not heard. And women are just as bad. So, and I'm going to say it to women, yeah, we are just as bad. You all know it. Stop it. Stop it. It was boy lo locker room talk. Who cares what the hell he said? You know what I mean? Who cares? They blew it out of proportion, you know, yeah. that he said this and that. who gives a shit? Because I guarantee right now there's a bunch of women sitting down at a bar somewhere. like with guys walking in or whatever you know what judging the same guys or making the same remarks and i can say that because i am a woman and i am a woman who will say it you know True. so don't act like men are any different than women because that is bullshit you know and it's going to come out but you can't hold it against that person for something that they didn't know was recorded and who cares if it was recorded because women are no better you know yeah. i get it you know they're not And that's what really pisses me off about, like, we were talking about the comedy thing, the comedy anymore. Nobody could be, you know, have fun anymore because everybody's got a stick up their ass. You know, yeah. where's the comedy anymore? Oh, I'm offended. I'm offended. Oh, my God, it's a joke. Try me a friggin' river. You know? Well, I imagine how much fun I'm having by looking all of this as a spectator with a popcorn <laughs> and a soda. 
I'm telling you what, I might just <laughs> I have to join you on that one. Like, okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it just gets so old. And I know that women, we've fought to be equal to men. I get it, you know, but damn, you can't sit there and bitch about everything, everything. You know, and it's the same with the men. Oh, well, women this, and now we can't do this, and we can't make comments. But yeah, women are not going to ever admit that they're doing it too, you know? And I think it's just time for everybody to chill the hell out, you know? Yeah. Chill out. Let's bring back comedy, you know, back when shit was funny, you know? And let's leave politics out of the bullshit. Who cares? Let us do our jobs. We're not here to boast about, you know, what politicians we want or this and that we're here to do a freaking job and that's what we need to do and i mean so, even people they can't even be entertained anymore that aren't in the entertainment industry because they're afraid if they laugh at something that somebody's gonna look at them like for real you know what i mean one of those type things and so, that's the shit that just needs to stop yeah well i on on, on this i i would do like to add that i'm very respectful for everyone's feeling i don't want to offend anyone but then again yes uh life goes on and you need to laugh around even at your at your pain because this is how you survive right i mean if you can't have a good time while you're here then you know what the hell seriously yeah, yeah. i mean i'm not going to sit here and worry about what comes out of my mouth i have no filter i don't and I don't filter anybody who does these interviews. I refuse to because everybody's entitled to their own opinions. Everybody's entitled to their own thoughts. And I'm not going to filter myself. I'm not. Sure. And if somebody gets offended, oh, well, you know, that's your issue, not mine, you know. And I just get so tired of watching, you know, people can't have a good time anymore because they have to worry about every little thing. You know, every little thing. And it's the same way, even with, you know, when when you, you'll get your kick next year, trust me. <laughs> and it's going to be the same thing. Well, they said this and this, and it's going to be all over again. I guarantee that gets brought up again. They're going to use that again, you know, but women need to get it. Even if they haven't grown up with brothers, which I have, you know, we're no better. We're no better. Stop. Stop it. <laughs> You know what I mean? Stop it. Let's just all go back to having a good time, you know, sure. versus, oh, I'm offended. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't get it. <laughs> I really don't. Yeah. You know, I'm just an equal opportunity type person. <laughs> this is the best way. Yeah, this is the best That's way to right. do it. I am yeah. going to close us up, though, and I am going to thank you for coming on this has been hella fun i love it <laughs> thank you for having me and thank you our common friend richard witzel rick witzel oh uh, yes, he, he has, yes. <laughs> so I, I met him in 2018 mm -hmm. the first time when i came to california in 2018 i met him and he just showered so many praises about my work <laughs> everything that i couldn't believe that i'm sitting in you know so far away in a land and different land and this guy has actually seen my work and he knows everything and he actually uh gave so much con co you know context to my work and mm -hmm. and at the frustration that i was i was going through he actually formalized he said i can see that you're outgrowing your society you i can feel it i can see it that you're gonna be very very uh you know uncomfortable where you are and he he a, a, as a man of experience he was very right he saw this in 2018 and i actually moved here in 2022 so i it i was just you know and yeah and he and and, and i'm just in awe of that person and his uh experience and his work in the industry he's a great man he's a he great is funny man. as hell I'll, I'll tell you something. I'm going to close this out. Everybody, I want to thank you for watching. We very, we appreciate him coming on for sure. And we're going to say bye. See you later. <laughs>
that you love me You said that you care You say that you will die for me Girl, but you know that just how that I don't care what you say I don't care what you do No need to look to your left, girl Cause nothing belongs to you Now you try me You know you can't run them games on me Now you creeping I saw you stepping out with that G Set your poor heart free. 